my screen. All right, so I'll um, go ahead and get started if you like. Um, first yeah. of all, uh, Dr. Patton, thank you so much for doing this. I know that like you have just been crazy busy with all the things and um, there's so much that we want to talk to you about tonight. Um, we're recording this session in hopes that anyone can watch um, when they have time. Um, I know that there's a lot to cover, um, but I just wanted to give a, a brief introduction first of all about Raising Oak Cliff and then specifically um, about you. Um, but my name is Amanda Ryder and I am president of Raising Oak Cliff. And if you're not aware, it's an organization that's been around for a couple of years and um, we're really focused on Oak Cliff. Um, we're trying to make the connection between our neighborhood and our schools. And, um, you know, over the past couple of years, we've been trying to do just a lot of community events that are for everyone. Um, whether, you know, you live here or there, you go to that school or this school. And then with Methodist as our sponsor, I feel like we've really grown our organization. Um, and one of the things that Laura's really helped us do is connect with the resources at the hospital. And she was the first name, um, you were the first name that she offered up as coming to talk to us and uh, being a good resource for our organization. Um, we are mostly families, but not all of us are, but we all have a family. And so I feel like this talk is really um, for everyone. And I hope that um, no matter when they can watch, that they can really um, jump in here and learn more about, you know, some tips that you can provide and anything that the hospital can offer us as well in terms of resources. Um, do you want to give a brief introduction of yourself? So that way, I mean, I could tell you things about Dr. Patton, but I think it makes more sense for it to come from you. Well, just know that I am thrilled to be here tonight, too, to talk with you all, because um, we love that our practice is in Oak Cliff. We love our affiliation with Methodist, and I think this week has been um, a really a prideful moment for all of us um, to be part of this organization, because Methodist really did a great job with this, and we'll talk of, um, some about the vaccine and some about uh, COVID in general and holidays and that sort of thing. And I am Teresa Patton. I am part of Kessler Women's Healthcare, which is just across the street from Methodist Dallas. We are a practice of five uh, women physicians, and um, we're OBGYN, so we take care of women throughout their lifespan. Um, so we are here for you. Methodist is here for you, and we'll talk some about COVID tonight. And, you know, it is Zoom world and it is COVID world, so I will warn you ahead of time. I am home with my family, so if a dog or a child runs in, I'm sure you all will understand. Um, uh, and but I am here to answer as many questions as you want to answer as you want to ask tonight. Well, I I think we all just have to start with what have you experienced over the last couple of days? Um, I heard and read and saw and saw all the comments about how you were the first hospital to receive the COVID vaccine. And so just what was that experience like? Yeah, so we can go to the next slide there, Laura, if you want to. Um, I will say that, yes, the vaccine is here, and we are thrilled that it happened. Um, so I knew, and uh, I'm an independent practitioner, so I'm affiliated with Methodist Dallas and involved in some of the behind-the-scenes conversations, but not all of them. Um, so when I heard that Methodist was going to be one of four Texas hospitals to get the vaccine on Monday, um, I was as thrilled and surprised and shocked as everybody. Um, and that really has to do with the um, administration and the work that they started in the summertime. So we're talking months ago, they started um, with the planning that it took for us to get that. And my understanding is that we had the capability to store the vaccine um, and, you know, communicated with the state and, and national people that we needed to communicate with to get that vaccine to us as quickly as possible. Um, you know, it's thrilling to be part of the, the one of the first few. Um, it, you know, the, the, um, the, you know, part of me also says, you know, everybody else got it on day two. So it's not like we had this huge jump on everybody, but it was still a lot the energy around the hospital in the in the last couple of days has been really exciting. And for those of you who weren't on the call when we were chit chatting early on, um, we all I've saw I've seen more tears and more posts and more excitement at the hospital than I have seen since the beginning of this uh, pandemic.
pandemic. So it was thrilling. Um, <clears throat> I got mine yesterday. So um, I was in that, that group. They got it at the beginning. I will tell you that I have had zero issues with it except for a sore arm. Um, you know, there is um, some potential that you could have some fever and fatigue and that sort of thing, just like with any other vaccine. Um, I've been taking Tylenol around the clock just because I want to keep working and we get our temperature checked everywhere we go. So I don't want that potential for there to be a fever there that would prevent me from continuing to care for patients. So, um, but, you know, not a big deal. Um, I will say that the studies have shown that the second dose, which we will get in about three weeks, is where some of that reaction tends to be a little bit more, but um, you know, I, I would have waited on the phone with the schedulers for 24 hours to get that uh, appointment that I got um, if it took that. And I am, you know, first in line and telling everybody else that when it becomes available for everybody, everybody should get it. So um, we did vaccinate close to 500 employees on that first day. Um, and then, like I said, other hospitals are getting that vaccine today and have started their vaccination process as well. Can you tell me um, what it felt like when you got the vaccine? Like, I mean, is it just like getting the flu from, from a, like me, myself, like I go in and get Uh shots every year. Did it feel the same? So I was worried that it was going to hurt a little bit more just because of the cold temperatures that it has to be stored at. And my medical assistants in my office always talk about how they have to get the flu vaccine out early and warm it up so that it doesn't hurt quite so much when they give it to patients. Uh, but I will tell you that I feel like it, it hurt less going in than the flu vaccine. Oh. Um, my arm was more sore today than with any flu vaccine I've ever gotten, but I suspect that's because my body um, formed that response it was supposed to form and hasn't and it hasn't seen this before. So I suspect that's why it was a little more sore today. All right. That's, I think, I mean, I would think that's what a lot of people are curious about. I mean, I, everyone's been talking about the cold temperature and so it does warm up a bit mm-hmm. before going in as a vaccine. Yeah, so it has to be thawed. And um, the tricky part from a scheduling standpoint for our staff is that once we thaw it, it has to be used within five hours, I think. So we're trying to not waste any of those doses, obviously, and getting people in in those gaps that uh, weren't scheduled, um, which is what makes it really tricky for the widespread distribution of this particular vaccine. Um, there are three vaccines that are likely to be approved, and I think one of those three doesn't need the really super cold temperatures. Um, and so that may be more um, beneficial to those facilities, especially in rural Texas, who, who don't have the capability of storing it. Um, but I, you know, this is all shifting sand, you know, changing ground all the time as far as how the distribution is going to happen on a widespread um, standpoint. Um, I know that CVS and Walgreens are doing um, the stuff that they need to do to try to be capable of getting it to everybody. But certainly for anybody who's not in the high risk groups that we'll talk about, um, it, it may be months and it, I couldn't tell you how it's actually going to happen from a logistic standpoint. Okay. We can go to that next slide about that. Um, so there is a tiered approach. I know you guys have all heard about this. Healthcare workers, long-term care facility patients and employees are getting it first. Um, and then persons with risk factors for severe disease, over 65, and then the general public, hopefully by spring of 2021. Um, it seems like every uh, new story I see that date moves up a little bit. So I know we were talking at first uh, summer, I keep hearing spring. Um, all of that um, just tells me that the studies with the other vaccines are um, very hopeful and very um, uh, positive as far as their response and their effectiveness. We can go to that next. Okay, so once you get your vaccine, then what? Um, so my husband asked me early on, once you get your vaccine, what are you going to do differently? And I said, nothing. I am going to sleep more soundly. Um, I'm going to worry less about bringing it home to my family, although the science isn't quite there. We don't know that for sure. Um, but I am going to be more reassured once I get it. Still wearing a mask, still have to do the physical distancing, still have to do the hand washing. Um, and then I listed those high-risk settings there that we should avoid. Um, and really, it, it is anywhere that physical distancing and mask wearing cannot be accomplished outside of your bubble. Um, and this isn't going to change until 70 to 80% of the population is vaccinated. 
Um, and the really uncertain thing about that is what does that mean? Does that mean vaccinated this season? Does it mean vaccinated at all? We don't know if this is going to be a yearly thing like the flu or if it's going to be a once and you're done or twice and you're done once you get the booster. We really don't have that information yet. Um, so that 70 to 80 percent may be 70 to 80 percent of us getting it on a yearly basis. Um, so, you know, there's still a lot unknown, but but there's not a lot that's going to change. So when I told my husband that, he said, yeah, but you're going to do the grocery shopping now. <laughs> <laughs> Because we had split it between, you know, I would, uh, he works from home. So I'm going out to work. He would do the grocery shopping and, and he loves to be in the grocery store and I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess that's mine as soon as I get a response. Um, which does bring me to the holidays. And, and this has been quite a controversial topic. But uh, what the CDC says is that, and we really shouldn't be celebrating those holidays with people outside of our homes. Um, or anybody that's in your your bubble. Um, if you are going to celebrate with those outside of your bubble, outdoor is better than indoor. Um, a shorter time period is better than a longer time period. Um, local is better than distance. So the more um, communities that you mix, then, then the higher the risk is there. And mask is, and physical distancing is better than hugs for this year. Um, I think we can all see the light at the end of the tunnel now. So, um, you know, before people were saying, you know, I got to live my life. I can't be without my family. Um, and while I feel for all of that, I have to say the vaccine is here. And if we all get vaccinated next year's Christmas and Thanksgiving, it's going to look very different than this year's. Um, so the best thing for now is virtual, um, if you can do that. <clears throat> Um, so before I move on to what if you get sick, I, I, because I know you guys had some questions on this. Do you guys have any questions, any more questions about vaccine and holidays? I mean, I don't. Anyone feel free to weigh in. Um, I feel like there's been so much said in the last couple of days about all of that, that I, I totally agree with everything that you said. And I appreciate you going back over it one more time. Um, Amanda, this is Trisha. Could I ask a quick question? Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Patton, do you have any knowledge on when kid vaccines might be available for kids and, and sort of like how necessary that is if if the science is still out there that maybe kids aren't the big transmitters, if, if most of the adults get vaccinated, are we still, you know, headed for herd immunity without a kid vaccine? So I'm glad you asked about that because there's a couple of populations that I do want to mention. So kids, um, the studies went down to 16. They're still in, there weren't a huge amount of people in the study between 16 and 18, but 16 to 18 year olds tend to act like adults anyways, um, physiologically. So I think um, there's a lot of confidence in that time period or that age group getting it. And there is some talk that there will be enough science to get you down to um, 12 pretty quickly. Um, and then yes, they're going to recommend that, that those kids get it. Um, below 12, it's a little up in the air still. Um, but I will tell you, it, we talk about the science of kids not transmitting, um, but there's not a lot of science yet. So I think we're still so early in this that I would not um, feel comfortable saying that kids are not transmitting. What I will say is that schools tend to be doing a really good job right now at, um, at preventing exposure once an exposure is identified. So most of the things, that, you know, I'm looking at Irving ISD data because that's where my kids go to school. But a lot of what I'm seeing is that the, the cases that are in the schools are brought in from the community and shut down pretty quickly. There are high-risk high activities like athletics and choir and band, and those things um, can increase the risk. But, um, but I think the schools are doing a pretty good job. Um, on that note, though, um, pregnancy and breastfeeding is another question that I get a lot of, obviously, because of what I do. Um, but um, what the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine and what ACOG has both come out and said is that um, pregnant and breastfeeding women should not be excluded from getting the vaccine as healthcare workers right now because we there are known risks of COVID in those populations. And so it is a detriment to their health and their fetus's health um, by preventing them from getting the vaccine uh, now. By the time the general population is vaccinated, we're gonna have a lot more data on that. Um, but the statements and the science that they have put together uh, really make me feel comfortable recommending that my breastfeeding and pregnant patients get the vaccine if they're in a high exposure um, situation. 
Thanks, Dr. Patton. That was actually a question in the chat from someone. Oh, you know, recommendations for the vaccine for women who are pregnant or trying to get pregnant. So. Yeah, and I think the reason that the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine and ACOG came out so strongly is because the the, um, the general vaccine science um, is so positive with this type of vaccine um, that it's really harmful for women to avoid it um, in this time period when they're most at risk. All right, I see your next slide. I think this is really... Um, I would assume that a lot of people struggle with this. Like, first of all, people are already freaking out if they get sick, period. But then it's like, well, what do I have? Like, am yeah. I really sick? Yeah, so it's tough all the way around. You get a fever and you have no idea um, in this world and your, your mind automatically goes to COVID. Um, I will tell you it's tough as a patient. It's tough as an employer. It's tough as a physician um, to tell people what to do um, because especially with flu, flu and COVID are so similar in their initial symptoms that um, it's hard to know. But, you know, we deal a lot with breast infection and mastitis in our breastfeeding population. And even those, even though we probably know what's going on, we still have to recommend getting tested. So the first thing I will tell you is that the symptoms are very similar, but the loss of taste and smell is a really key symptom with COVID. So if you have loss of taste and smell, um, you really need to make sure that, that your providers know that that's going on with you. I have a cinnamon candle in my house. I hate scented candles, but I have a cinnamon candle in my house that I sniff probably four times a day <laughs> just to make sure that I can still smell. Um, so if you have loss of, of taste and smell, you need to let your doctors know. And um, what I will say also is that because we're all wearing our masks and washing our hands and staying away from each other, we haven't seen flu yet this season. Um, I can't speak to the data at the hospital, but in my office, we're seeing it all the time in previous years, and we just have not seen very much of it this year. So I'm not sure I'm going to go another flu season without wearing a mask because, of, yeah, I haven't been sick since the summertime. Um, but if you have any symptoms of the sort, then you need to immediately isolate. Um, and that isolation ends up being for at least 10 days from the time you have symptoms. Um, and you need to call your doctor for instructions. So most of the time, docs will tell you to come in and do flu testing and COVID testing or to get that done somewhere. We do our testing in our parking lot just because it's easier for us to do that and get an eyeball and make sure that you're doing okay. If your flu test is positive, then it's just like any other year. You stay home until you have no fever for 24 hours and you feel like you can go back to work. Um, if you are COVID positive, positive, then the CDC now says that you can return after 10 days if you have mild disease and if you are not immunocompromised. That changes to 20 days if you have severe disease and are admitted to the hospital or if you have some sort of uh, immune compromise um, illness. Um, and you have to have improvement in your symptoms and no fever before you can go back to work. Now, the question that we have a lot in the office is, what if my COVID is negative and my flu is negative, but I still had a fever and these upper respiratory infections, then what? Well, the problem is that you can have um, false negatives. And so what the CDC is recommending is either a second negative test so that we can be sure it's a negative COVID for sure, um, or just stay home for those 10 days um, until you're out of that symptom. Um, until you're in that symptom-free or symptom improvement stage. We can go to the next slide. Uh, Dr. Patton, before yeah. we move on, there was another question in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. Someone just asked, uh, Janet, she asked if you could repeat your answer or advice for breastfeeding mothers. Are they okay to take the vaccine? So breastfeeding, the CDC has come out clearly and said, breastfeeding, yes, you should take the vaccine. Uh, the question in the CDC mind, CDC's mind is still pregnant women because we don't have the data yet, but the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine and um, ACOG have come out and said that um, especially healthcare workers who had increased risk in general of contracting COVID, that they should get the vaccine. And by the time the general public has the ability to get the vaccine, we're probably going to have more data in that group. Thank you. Definitely ask your doctor. <laughs> Should have said that from the beginning. I get really annoyed when other people weigh in on my patients, so <laughs> make sure you're asking your doctor. All right, and then if you get exposed, so you're not having symptoms, but you have an exposure, and the CDC uh, defines exposure as more than 15 minutes in a 24-hour period um, with close contact on somebody who's positive. 
So then uh, the recommendation is to quarantine for 14 days, although some um, situations, particularly in healthcare, they're dropping that down to 10 days, um, depending on how urgent it is for you to return to work. Um, if you have symptoms develop at any point during those 14 days, then you go back to that previous slide and you follow that recommendation uh, that's there. Um, I know these terms have been thrown around a lot. So quarantine and isolation are different. So quarantine just means you are not having symptoms. It means you need to stay in your house and not really go anywhere and not, con not get in contact with other people. Um, you can still see your family, but you need to stay masked and distant. So not a lot of hugging. I know that's really hard with young kiddos, but lots of masks and lots of hand washing um, in that situation. Um, isolation means that you have been um, symptomatic and or tested positive. And then that means in a room, preferably with a separate bathroom with really limited contact with others. Um, and if you're in an isolation standpoint, I, I tell all of my patients buy those um, oxygen saturation monitors that you can get on Amazon so that you know when you need to get help. Any questions about that before we move on? I don't think so. All right, so I, you know, initially we, I was talking about stress relief because we have lots of reasons to be stressful now. So obviously COVID is stressful for all of us, but not only COVID, but juggling kiddos at home with school, um, working from home, all of that stuff. And so what I, what I was gonna talk about, we'll just <laughs> shorten to this few minutes um, and remember that you need to fuel your body, soul, and mind. Um, exercise is super important. Exercise outside helps both from a mental standpoint and a physical standpoint. And when it comes to diet, really uh, think about eating the rainbow, um, limiting your fried foods, limiting your sugar, and eating the rainbow rainbow of vegetables and fruits. Um, fueling your soul, obviously do that with your bubble and your family, but come up with ways that you can do that with your extended family um, virtually. Um, you know, religion, as long as it's done safely and, and distanced, it's fine. A lot of uh, churches are doing services online, so that's also a good option for you. Um, and I throw activism in there, um, and I will say that activism in a limited capacity, because if you get too much into it, I know for me, <laughs> it gets very stressful. So um, make sure you know your limits and, and know what fuels you and not what uh, steals from you. And then fuel your mind. So sleep is super important. Make sure you're getting those eight hours a night. Um, I will say with my vaccine yesterday, I did sleep better last night than I think I have in months. Um, even though it's not even fully effective for another few weeks, it was really reassuring. Um, and then meditation is really great. I use uh, meditation for my kiddos and meditation for me. I love the app. Um, I think it's called Your Life Now. Um, you can also search on Stop, Breathe, and Think. Um, it used to be Stop, Breathe, and Think. Um, they're, they're really good five-minute guided meditations um, that can help settle that mind down. We also have a really good wellness uh, center at Methodist that helps with our staff. Um, and so uh, a lot on our morning huddles now, they're doing some a uh, couple of times a week where we do a, a guided meditation. And I know that Laura has one um, set up for us that we'll do here as we end. And then after we do the meditation, um, I'm happy to come back and answer any questions that you guys have. Hopefully she has better luck than the last time I tried to do this. Can y'all hear it? No, but can you turn the sound up on the video itself? There you go. No, it was up. Hmm. So we had the same thing last time. So what I will do is I will just talk you through it. So she's going to, if you'll pause it right there for me, Laura. Um, what she's going to do is have you take a deep breath in as the ball expands and then pause at the top. And then exhale. breathe out. Breathe out. The sphere deflates. So as your ribs deflate. Inhale. Breath in. Lift. Pause. Exhale. Empty completely. Release it all out. One more time. Biggest breath right here. Expand and feel your ribs up. Empty out and pause. Let it all go. You've just reduced your heart rate, reduced your blood pressure, 
and take a few moments to just feel and notice your body. So what I find that that does um, is that if you do um, a meditation practice routinely kind of at home, then uh, what happens when you're in a stressful situation is you don't even recognize that you're doing it, but you will start to take those deep breaths, which will slow your heart rate um, and calm you in the moment when you don't even know that it's happening. The other one that I find really healthy is when you're doing those deep um, breathing exercises that you think about um, somebody who you have a lot of love for and get along really well with and give them gratitude. And then you do the same for somebody that you don't really know well at all, like your mailman. Um, and then you do the same. This one is the most helpful for me. Um, you do the same for somebody who you really struggle to get along with and try to send them some gratitudes and, um, and happy thoughts. And so if you do that uh, on a kind of on a routine basis, then when you're in the situation and you're stressed, you can make it a, you can kind of just fall into it uh, without even thinking about it. And that is what we had for you tonight. So those breathing exercises that you're recommending, are you, would, would you do those in the morning, at night, when you're stressed out, with your kids? Like, what are your recommendations? So I think a really good meditation practice is better when you do it routinely, whenever that works for you. So if it's your lunch break that works best for you, then do it then. If it's right before bed, I find it more helpful right before bed because it settles my mind down and lets me sleep. Um, if it's right in the morning when you wake up before you pick up your phone and start doom scrolling Twitter, um, if you pick instead, think about your gratitudes in the morning and that's helpful for you, then do it then. Whatever is easiest for you to do routinely, because then when you're in those stressful situations, your body will automatically revert back to that. And um, since I probably most of us have kids, um, I know initially the talk was going to be more focused with them. Do you have any tips specifically about maybe calming the kids down or how we can <laughs> deal with all the kids being at home over the holidays, mm -hmm. something like that? So, you know, the kids will do meditation too, and I've used it a lot for my kiddos. So I have a 14-year-old daughter um, who struggled a lot with settling down at night to go to sleep. And so I started using some of those five-minute meditation, guided meditations with her. Um, the other thing that she does that's really helpful for her is listening to an audiobook at night um, because it makes her focus on something other than her racing mind. Mm. Um, my 10-year-old is probably much like many of your 10-year-olds where they're just kind of on the go all the time. And there's a particular guided meditation on that Stop, Breathe, and Think or the Your Life that talks about the lion mind versus the dog mind. Um, and how to differentiate between that. So if you're sitting there and you have a bone and you have a dog in front of you, that dog is going to follow that bone. You throw the bone across the room, the dog is going to chase the bone. The lion will watch the bone and watch you. You'll throw the bone. The lion may look at the bone, but the lion is going to return its attention to you instead of that bone. And so whenever my kiddo is kind of bouncing off the walls, I remind him, are you, are you in the dog mind right now or are you in the lion mind? Should you be focusing on something other than everything else that's going on around you? Um, and it really does kind of snap him back to what he's supposed to be doing. All right. Does anyone who's joined us have any questions ranging from, you know, the virus anything. to the holidays to I haven't seen my doctor in a whole year and is it safe? <laughs> I know I feel that way about my dentist. That's just one thing that I still haven't, um, even though I keep getting letters saying it's completely safe, but, um, but in terms of going into, you know, a doctor's office and, you know, do you do, is it okay to do a wellness check over the phone or, you know, do you have any suggestions about that? So it is safe to see your providers now. Um, even the dentists are doing, you know, they're wearing N95s, which helps protect um, others. And there's a lot of um, evidence coming out now that the masks not only protect others, but they protect you too. Um, so wearing it in those spaces where there are other people, obviously with the dentist, you have to take it off eventually, but um, they're wearing protection and, and I think they're doing a really good job. Um, most offices are spacing 
appointments out enough. Um, our office, I know we've we've extended our hours and we've staggered the docs and we've added some Saturdays. And so we're doing some things to kind of keep people not in our waiting room. Um, my advice to give you is if you go to get your uh, wellness um, or any doctor's appointment or imaging or anything, and you walk in and that lobby is insane, you have every right to say, here's my cell phone number. I'm going to go wait in the car and you call me when you're ready. Um, so definitely don't neglect your health, but also don't put yourself at risk. Right. Oh, and telemed. You asked about telemed. Um, so we are doing a whole lot more telemed now than we ever did before. And there's a lot of things that we can do. Obviously, I don't want to see pictures or video or any of the stuff, <laughs> that, the, <laughs> the stuff that we do. Um, but, you know, birth control follow-up, hormones uh, we can talk about over the phone, um, in-depth uh, results conversations that we would normally bring you into the office for. Um, we all have a designated uh, telemed day where we're doing that, and the telemed rules have relaxed a little bit. I'm hoping they stay relaxed, but I'm thinking even if they don't stay relaxed, uh, we're going to invest in some capability of, of doing some of those visits remotely um, from here on out because they've just been really super convenient for everybody. And I really feel like, you know, some of the stuff, the weight loss conversations and the you know, some of the really in-depth stuff that I get into, I feel like I have more time and focus to do that um, from a telemed standpoint. And I feel like my patients are getting a better experience than they would in the office when things are crazy and I'm running around. Yeah, I hear that. Um, anyone else on the call have any questions or comments? Um, while we're here, I just wanted to say that um, we will have another joint conversation with Methodist next month. Um, Laura, do you want to um, say a little bit about what's coming up? Yeah. So we've asked um, a pediatrician to come talk to the group in January, and she's going to talk coming? about It's Kenzie Saltarelli. Have you met her? Yeah. I have. She's wonderful. Yeah, she, she's really fun. She's really easygoing. And um, she actually will be a pediatrician at the new clinic that's going to open up on Davis Street. So if you know where Davis Street Espresso is, and next to that is oil and cotton, and then next to that, they're building a building. That's where the new clinic will be. Yeah, I didn't know if if that, that was like everyone knew, but I also wanted to talk about that because it is like the building is starting. And if you haven't been down Davis, it's worth driving by just to see the progress that's already being made. Yes. And um, I think it's super convenient spot. I mean, there's a parking lot behind where um, like Joey Macaroons and Encanto Pops is, so you can park there, but they're also building a parking lot nearby, and it'll have Methodist designated spots and all that stuff, because I think that's one question that kept coming up, is like, where are we going to park, because it's not a big old lot, but it'll be a convenient way for you to see a pediatrician, for your kids to see a pediatrician, and for you to see your PCP all in one place. Right, it's a family practice, right? Yes. Yeah, so she's, she's med peds. So she's internal medicine and pediatric um, specialty boarded. So everybody can get their care, yeah. And when are you hoping that will be open? So that date keeps moving, but the last time <laughs> I heard was summer 2021. Okay, cool. <laughs> yes, but we will definitely keep you guys posted on that. And then another thing about Dr. Saltarelli is she lives down the street from me. She lives on Canty and Turner, so nice. she's our neighbor. She'll be able to walk to the office when it opens. And she's just overall a really nice uh, woman that I think you all will will enjoy seeing. And she'll be talking to us in January about screen time, about kids and screen time now, um, kids doing school on the computer, kids just having fun on the computer, and you know, entertainment. And how much should we concern, be concerned about that or not be concerned? What can we do to help them not be too, um, not want to leave the screen, yeah. but, you know, just to be on it all the time. And then I may have to log on just to hear. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll send that out. And, and of course, as always, like Dr. Patton did today, we're definitely open to other questions. We don't have to limit to that topic. It's just a starting off point, basically, for you all to feel comfortable about you know, talking of whatever's on your mind. 
And then the last thing that I just wanted to talk about is I a tentative date, I'm not 100% sure, but I think January 8th, um, we'll do another virtual conversation about um, what it's like to apply to DISD schools, whether it's your neighborhood school, um, you know, one of the magnet schools, all the paperwork that's involved, and especially now that you can't really go to the school, I'm hoping to have enough participants where if you do have questions about a particular school that another parent um, or some other representative will be online that could answer those questions for you. Um, the other thing for those that are interested, I've also contacted DISD and I've asked for them to create um, basically a video of walking through the school for what it looks like. Um, there's going to be a whole new group of families that have never visited any schools. And so if you have any other ideas or questions or you just don't know where to start, um, that conversation would be good to attend. But also, you know, just you can always email me or text me or call me, whatever, if there's something that's just, you know, you're just dreading or you don't, you need to know the question now. I'm always available for that kind of stuff. Um, Dr. Patton, do you have anything else you'd like to share? Or any other questions? I'm good. All right. Just stay well, safe over the holidays and there's light. Yes, and it's been really great for you to join us. And like I said, I know you've been busy, but um, I'm so happy for you, and I'm looking forward to getting my vaccine as well. Yeah. Spread the word. Let's all get it. All right. Thank you, Amanda. And if anybody has questions uh, um, later on, you can email Amanda, and she can get them to me and, and Dr. Patton. And, or you can just call Dr. Patton on her office. Her <laughs> phone number is right there. <laughs> And uh, if you have suggestions for topics, please also let Amanda know health topics or wellness or anything like that. You let us know. And, so. you know, as we're getting more vaccines out there, you know, eventually we'll start getting together soon. You know, I'm hoping in the spring we can do some virtual running events. Caitlin, <laughs> we can do <laughs> some more things together outside as a group. Um, and so I look forward to that as well. Yeah, us too. All right. um, thank you, Amanda. Thank yeah. you, everyone, for coming. No problem. Have a good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.